cool. Great to see so many. Great to see so many faces. Um, so hello. Today, the In Conversation series is actually a program undertaken um, each um, fortnight or month um, to keep the South Australian tourism industry um, and stakeholders engaged and informed as we work through um, the COVID-19 and into recovery scenario. Good afternoon to you all joining us today, Monday the 26th of July. For those who don't know me, I'm Cathy Ramsey. I'm the Partnerships Manager here at the Tourism Industry Council of South Australia, the peak tourism body. I will introduce our speakers shortly. However, it's really important just to run through a couple of housekeeping matters to keep this session running smoothly. Um, firstly, appreciate if everybody could please keep their microphone on mute. We'll use the chat function and you can already see uh, um, the housekeeping popped up there on the chat function for any questions and comments. And we'll endeavour to work through the questions as we go through the session today, also allowing some time for Q&A at the end. So we respect it's been a really difficult week for everyone and really grateful for everyone playing their part to get us where we are today with the welcome news um, from the Premier. There has been a lot of information to digest and today I'm really pleased to have both Hood Sweeney and Woman's Lawyers joining us to further unpack this. But firstly, I'm really wrapped to have Sean de Buren, Chief Executive of the Tourism Industry Council, together with Rodney Harritz, Chief Executive Officer of the South Australian Tourism Commission, joining us on our session today. Sean, can you give us a quick update on TICFA's advocacy activities? Thanks very much, Cathy. Um, yeah, there's never been a tougher time for our industry than what we're facing um, right now and over the last 18 months. We're very conscious that um, uh, there's all sorts of business circumstances occurring at the moment um, across the industry and definitely across our membership. <coughs> um, from an advocacy point of view, there's, uh, we've never done more in the advocacy space because it's never been more important for industry um, than what it has been over uh, the last 18 months. Um, we continue to um, engage with the Premier's office, primarily through his tourism advisor on a daily basis. Um, briefing, providing um, anecdotes and information in terms of what's going on in industry, um, providing examples of the hardship and the challenges that businesses are facing. We're very confident that the Premier and his office are, are well briefed on business circumstances for tourism businesses. Um, and uh, they, they do understand that the lockdown um, is only the beginning of the challenge for industry as the tail coming out of the lockdown is varied for so many different businesses in terms of being able to stand back up again. Um, we're also able to assist um, businesses with specific queries. Um, an example of this was one of our members um, was a contact site. They had to undertake a deep clean, which they're doing today. They needed some advice in terms of how to do that and what support was available through the Premier's office, we're able to get a quick response in terms of um, what government support was available. Um, so we encourage you, please reach out to us, myself or one of the team, please update us on your business circumstances. That information does greatly assist in terms of providing tangible and factual information um, to government. Um, lastly, and I, I know we're tight for time, so I'm just going to keep it really top level. But again, I do encourage you to send me an email or a, give me a call if you'd like to discuss things further. We are out there in the media advocating for, um, you know, industry's um, circumstances. Um, primarily, we've been undertaking radio. There was a, an, an article in today's advertising you might have noticed uh, as well around the, the challenges that industry is facing. Um, so um, uh, we'll continue to undertake that um, communications um, into um, political offices um, across the media and obviously with industry and stakeholder groups as well. Um, lastly, I would just like to um, reiterate the fact that we are going through a um, recovery and um, state election advocacy consultation process at the moment. Um, we have put out a draft paper. 
Um, if you have time, we encourage you to have a look at it. There's a brief survey that accompanies it. We would very much welcome any further feedback you have for um, state election advocacy that we move into as we move closer to March 2022. Um, I, I think I'll stop it there, Cathy. There's lots more I that could talk about, but I know that we're here to uh, specifically go through um, information with Hood Sweeney and Warmans. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate that, that quick messaging. Um, welcome, Rodney. I'll get, I'll get there and get that done correctly one day. Thank you, Cathy. And uh, <laughs> no, you're... Sean, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'd also just like to recognise the lands that we meet on today, the traditional owners, pay our respects to past, present and emerging. Look, thank you uh, for the opportunity to connect, um, you know, uh, comments similar to Sean. Like, I mean, we have been uh, engaging, our team have been talking um, with businesses right across the state um, to understand what are the things that, you know, we can do to assist as the SATC. Um, you know, as Sean touched on, there have been a number of sites, tourism sites, Sites, um, that have been identified and the team have uh, been helping uh, those businesses as well. So again, I, I like Sean, I uh, echo if there are things that we can assist uh, in this particular situation, please let us know. Um, the team are working now um, to activate now that we're clear on, um, you know, there's, there's um, some direction out of this. The team are working to um, put a number of programs in place to, to build out of this. What is clear is that the focus needs to be very much on the South Australian market. Um, and what is also clear is that South Australians have got a great appetite to get out and explore our state. Um, and we think that there's a, a continuing opportunity. Um, we've made adjustments around uh, vouchers so those consumers that have been impacted with um, they've you know they've been contacted and um, they've been moved um, the voucher program I think is going to be particularly important um, as we build out of this a lot of works going on around events as well like I mean there are a number of events that have been significantly impacted um, and we have been working with those organizations because again it's a key way to get people up and re-engaged uh, and get out and about. So um, again, I know uh, timing is very tight. What I would say is that the team at the Tourism Commission um, is here to help and work with uh, industry. If there's anything uh, that you think that we should be doing, we can be doing, um, please do let us know. Um, and again, we, uh, like Sean, acknowledge uh, the challenges uh, that these difficult decisions make for business. Um, and I guess what is crucial now is how we build out of that, how we work together to build out of that. Um, I think what is clear is that um, if we can get people moving again, um, there will be, uh, you know, some opportunities to get those South Australians going again. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And again, um, you know, please, if there are things that people want to follow up with, um, I'm happy, please email through to us and, um, and we'll follow up. Thank you very much, Cathy. Thanks so much, Rod. I just like to acknowledge um, Rod, um, uh, very last minute, um, um, has made himself available um, and uh, really appreciate, Rod, everything SATC is doing and uh, your support for industry. Ab absolutely. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Rodney. Appreciate both the insights that you've both shared with us today. It's great. I know it's valuable to me and I'm sure it's valuable to the rest of the community just to see um, tickets, hear about some of the ac activities around Tickasee's advocacy, but also um, the work and the key priorities on hand that the SATC are continuing to work tirelessly to deliver for our industry during this challenging time. Moving on, Moving on though, it's a real pleasure to introduce Priya Sharda from Hood Sweeney. Whilst Priya might be a familiar face to many of you, um, she's the Associate Director of Accounting in Accounting and Business Advisory at Hood Sweeney, including leading the team in specialty food and hospitality. Priya, the state government has announced the SA Business Support Grants, emergency payments for small to medium sized businesses um, impacted by the current lockdown. Can you talk us through the eligibility criteria for businesses needing to access this? Yeah, no, thanks, Cathy, and thanks for that introduction. Um, I guess, uh, um, and thanks everyone for letting me speak today. I know these are challenging, very challenging times and I do appreciate um, you giving me the opportunity just to sort of explain a little bit more 
about the COVID-19 business support grants. Now, I'm not sure how many people are aware, but this has all happened very quickly. So last week, Rob Lucas and Steve Marshall mentioned these grants. There are actually two grants currently available at the moment, and it's really dependent on whether you employ people. Also, if you can show that your turnover has reduced by 30% because of the lockdown in the week of the 20th of July, 2021. So if you're an employing business, i.e. you have staff and you employ people, you are eligible for a $3,000 grant. And if you're a non-employing business, i.e. You, you don't have any staff, it's a sole trader, you're eligible for the $1,000 grant that's currently available. So to be eligible for, and this is through the SA Treasury website, and this will be through SA Treasury. Now, just one thing to mention before I jump into the eligibility criteria, over the last 48 hours, it's been made um, aware to us that if you were successful in grant one and grant two last year, Treasury, and if they have the same, and you have the same email details, Treasury is actually contacting people this week and asking you, have you, um, you received the two prior emergency grants? Are you, have you dropped your income by 30% and have your details changed? So you may get an email, just want to make people aware of that because at the moment there's a lot of spam we all know and you might think, oh, this email from Treasury, this is just a bit of a scam and delete. So please be aware that if you get an email from Treasury this week, they'll ask you the question, you're declaring your circumstances and it will actually fast track your application. So just be aware of that before I jump into the eligibility criteria. Right. Thanks, Priya. So that's if you've have already received last yes. year yes. Um, payments. Round from one and round two. Round one and so round the two. 10, 000 okay. And the 3,000. Yes, that's correct. So many of you might be in that situation where you've already received, um, had received monies from round one and round two. And just to re reiterate, um, Treasury already have your details yes. and you keep an eye on those emails because you should be getting some notification from them. Yeah, and that's, I believe that this week. And then if they are accepting, it's in the next week, you should actually get the payment. So just something to wow. be because I don't think I think that sort of got lost a little bit in like the media at the moment. Yep. Fabulous. Yeah. That's a great key point to share. Thank you. No worries. So to be eligible for the $3,000 grant, a business must meet the following criteria. They must be located within SA. You must have an annual turnover of 75000 or more in the 2021 financial year or the 2020 year, and you must be registered for GST. You must also have a valid or an active ABN. You must employ people in South Australia. You must have, if you did employ people in Australia, you have an Australian wide payroll of less than 10 million in the 2020 year. And you must have experienced at least a 30% reduction in turnover in the week of Tuesday, the 20th of July, 2021 to, to Monday, the 26th of July, 2021, which is today. So it's inclusive of that whole period compared to the week before at the same time. So that's the eligibility criteria for the $3,000 grant. If you're applying for the $1,000 grant, i.e. you don't employ people, the criteria is the same. The only difference is you don't have to obviously um, employ staff. That's the difference between the two grants. Okay. And just jump into one other thing, if you don't mind, Kathy, just talking sure. about where the application process is currently. Yeah, because I can see basically on the Treasury website, you must register your interest. Mm. Yeah. When's the anticipated applications might open? Yeah. And so what's that sort of process? Yeah, so at the moment, um, the app, so at the moment, you can't actually apply for the grant. Um, it, it's in the next, in the coming week is when it's anticipated that the grant application process will be open. However, before you do that, we understand that you need to register for the grant. So the way to do it, is actually jump onto the SA Treasury website and there's a button on the website on the, um, saying register here. All you need to do to register your interest is provide your business name, your business ABN, your contact details, and they'll also ask you the question, did you get the round one and round two grant last year, the 10,000 to 3,000? Once you've registered your interest, they will actually send you an email when the application process starts. So we believe that will be in the next week or so, but once that application process starts, then you can jump into actually the grant. 
Now, just something to be aware of, just in terms of timing, because a couple of my clients have asked me personally, um, how long do we have to register or get this grant? Now, there is a, a limited amount of funds that the government, not it's a decent amount, but the government's um, giving an amount of funds for this COVID payment. You don't actually have to, the application process is actually open to the 30th of September. However, the quicker you apply, the quicker you will get the grant money. Sure. Okay. The last moment in case the funds have run out. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's some great detail. So Priya, sort of pack, unpacking that eligibility criteria mm -hmm. a little bit more, yeah. how, what sort of information would I need to use to demonstrate a 30% reduction in turnover? Sure, no, that's a great question. So even though the application process actually hasn't come out and we haven't actually been able to apply on any of our, for our clients yet, they, the, there has been some guidance about what we need to do. So unlike the last grants where you had to provide VASAs and tax returns and all that sort of stuff, you don't actually have to provide that detail this time in the application process. So the application process, I believe, is just a declaration that you have experienced a loss or reduction of turnover due to restricted trading conditions. However, just, and it's so based on an honesty system, and I believe that's done because they're trying to fast track these payments. However, that doesn't mean you can just apply for the grant and assume you'll get it and you'll never get checked out. You will need to provide some supporting documentation or put together a little bit of a package and save it into your system somewhere. So the, the Treasury is allowed up to 12 months to audit people. So they're allowed to check people and get that information. Sure. So, even so though what you don't sort of... have to show any, um, don't actually have to give anything in your application process, there are some things that you should put aside or to determine if you've done this 30% downturn to have some supporting documentation available. So that's a number of things. One is to have the financial data showing the comparison turnover from the week before the 20th of July to the 20th of July week. You should have, if you've got emails or texts to and from customers or suppliers detailing cancelled orders or bookings, make sure you keep them to show this you, you were actually affected because of the lockdown. You weren't just having a bad week. You've got receipts or refunds provided that you have to give back to clients. So you've got that detail. You've got appointments, scheduling platforms, demonstrations, cancelling appointments or bookings. So make sure you put together a bit of a package. And if you've got any screenshots of cancelled events, make sure you keep it. So it's yeah. important the financial data, make sure you can prove to the treasurer, yeah, it's because of the lockdown. These are all the cancellations we had. These are all the um, emails and texts. So just keep that together. So you may not yeah. have to keep the application, but you will need to put it aside because they have, they have mentioned that there is about 12 months um, they have to um, go back and audit you. Absolutely. Thanks, Priya. That's really valuable to share. So, you know, think about what demonstrates that 30% loss mm. and we know you've you know it's your reservation screens you mm. know uh, if you've got any screenshots if you've got your forecasting reports previously mm. um, and even those refunds that you've issued uh, that's a really great way to demonstrate that um, that evidence that you've qualified. Um, and whilst you've mentioned it's really important to obviously keep this evidence for future reporting, yeah. Priya, I'm sure it's important to make sure you demonstrate, in demonstrating that 30% um, reduction, it's, it's also probably got to line up with your BAS and your yeah. tax return as well. I'm sure that's probably some, is that pretty mind, yeah. some things we should be mindful of? Yeah, so um, I had a client recently ask me about invoicing and things like that. So my comment to them is, even though you don't have to prove, show your BAS, you don't have to prove, put your BAS in, obviously, because we're only talking about a week. So we're talking about the week before, what was the income and versus... And obviously, there are going to be some people who you completely shut down, you went into lockdown, restaurants were shut completely. You know, there are ways to... Obviously, you're in industry that has obvious proof that you were affected by this lockdown. There's no doubt about it. But one thing to be aware of, if, you're, if your BAS is on like for a cash basis, for example, make sure when you show your downturn, it's also on a cash basis. So line up any proof that you're, and the supporting information you're putting together, make sure you line it up into any formal documentation that you're gonna to have to lodge down the track like BASs or anything like that. Um, uh, okay. Kathy, can I break the rules and ask a question? Um, it's a comment yeah. I've heard from a number of businesses, so I'm sure there'll be a number of people online. Um, yeah. 
a lot of tourism businesses aren't, um, you know, selling coffees, you know, for example, yeah. where you know, 100 people buy a coffee one day and then no one turns up the next and they yeah. don't sell any coffees, you know, because no one's around. Like, uh, you know, <coughs> an example would be a tour operator that offers a multi-day experience. Everything is booked, you know, several weeks, yeah. if not months out. It's, yeah. it's not a transactional sort of daily basis type of hospitality um, yeah. business type. So they're depending on what is happening in the business and also the fact that Victoria and New South Wales were closed prior to last week, people were already doing refunds and all those sorts mm. of things. So given that sort of general circumstance, it's 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 could be, you know, it's a bit of a question mark for yeah. some of the feedback I've had from a number of businesses. Yeah, no. How do you demonstrate that? Because their business type has different ebbs and flows of income um, and because there was also impacts with Victoria and New South Wales prior to our lockdown it doesn't it's not a clean cut sort of you know 30 percent Priya how do you answer that well and, and I and I agree with that and that's that is the difficulty about it the grant specifically says 30 percent it's a bit like the whole job keeper if you're 27 and a half or you're 20 percent um at the moment, I'm just going through what the grant says, the eligibility, but I do really recognise the fact the supporting information is going to be probably pretty important. Like we were talking to a client recently who basically had something similar to what you're saying, Sean, it's an accommodation place. And he was saying, look, I can't make the 30%, but I've got all these cancellations or all these things because of the lockdown in Victoria and things like that. Would that be enough to show? I think it's about in those sort of industries where it's not so clear cut, I think it's putting the supporting documentation in place and putting a bit of a case together to say, we have, in, um, because of the lockdowns and the restrictions, this is why we've had a downturn. I think that the grant the eligibility criteria does it, but I think when you're talking about this industry where you're right, it's not like hospitality. It's not like, um, you, know, you, you know, it's not one of those other industries that sort of can change it, their invoice, just don't invoice this week there has to be a bit of a case together. So there has to be a bit of supporting information. And I think that's why the government has said it's not just financial data, it's showing all the other cancellations and all the other information. Thanks. Um, just one other thing to be aware of, just in, I made a comment just about eligibility before in terms of employing businesses and non-employing businesses. And obviously there is that criteria, one of the eligibility criteria is 75,000. Now, just to be aware, if you're a non-employing business, i.e. you're a sole trader and you've already applied for the Commonwealth COVID-19 disaster payment, which is the federal government one, just be aware that you can't apply for the grant at the same time. You can't get money, one-off lump sum payments. Hello? 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 Is that Cathy frozen or...? Yeah, that's Kathy Frozen. I think she's been having a little bit of internet issues. She's oh, okay. Teenage boys are probably gaming or something at the moment, Priya. Yep, no worries. <laughs> um, in terms of so, so the reality is these grants are really only available if you've got a, if you've had in the past two years seventy five thousand dollars turnover or more. If you're under that, then you have to look at some other um, support, which would be potentially the South Australian one. If you're not in those hot spots or the COVID lockdown payments that the federal government is applying for. They're the two. Great, thanks Priya. I'm not sure if Cathy's back online. Um, I can't see her, but... Um, can I just ask you another question, uh, Priya? In, in your um, uh, dealings through different grant programs with Treasury, yeah, there's obviously the rules, but does common sense, is there a, do, do they apply common sense? Um, I'll be honest, in the past, it's usually pretty strict. If you don't meet the few criteria, they don't um, get it. We've had, like, in the last point of view, we had some sole traders who applied, but they worked from home, they didn't have a commercial lease, and they didn't get any of the grants, no matter how much you could prove they ran a business, there was no commercial lease, so they were just cut out. I think you've got those criteria, that it's a bit of a ticket box, and if you, do, so it's, you say you've met all this criteria, you declare that you've had a 30% downturn, you'll get your money. But it's the main thing is to say later on, if they audit you, do you have the right? I think it's worth um, putting together a bit of a package, but my experience technically has been that you usually just have to sort of tick the boxes and you get the grant. Okay, great. Just going to a few of the chat questions, Priya. I don't know if you can, sure. can you see them? Yeah, I can, yep. 
So there was an initial question there about the 30%. I think we've sort of covered that. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's no clear cut, um, uh, but it's about having an evidence-based evidence approach. It's the evidence. I still think there's no harm applying in terms of or registering your interest, but at the moment, the test has experienced at least a 30% reduction in turnover. There, it's pretty um, clear cut what they're asking to do. Um, Fraser from Backyard Universe, um, what if you no longer have a copy of your pre-lockdown booking calendar? Obviously, it's electronic. Um, does a schedule count as lost business for the lockdown period? So, obviously, Fraser's got an electronic calendar there, but he has a schedule that would provide evidence. Would that suffice mm -hmm. on a trade? Yeah, it's mainly just being able to put something together to show what's truthful and realistic for your business. So, obviously, if there's something that sort of the calendar's gone, but if you've got something that shows a schedule or you've, and then you've got text saying, I'm rescheduling, well, you've technically lost business for that week. Yeah. And um, uh, to go back to the original point, um, Coonawar Experiences support Steve. Obviously, a lot of businesses were having cancellation mm, and yeah. refunds for the weeks prior to the, um, the lockdown. So um, is the strategy there just about an evidence-based approach demonstrating that um, there has been a period of significant decline. Mm. And that's why I think this is why the government, unlike the other ones where they've been pretty strict about, you know, you have to have a BAS that shows 30% downturn. This time they're asking you to show like supporting information, which covers a whole bunch of things. It's not just the financial data, you, you get the text and everything. And you guys would have, a, in your industry, there would be particular parts of your industry that would have all these cancellations, which could surely put a case together, evidence-based. Great, thanks Priya. Cathy, I can see you back now. I know, even the best of us experience technical difficulties yeah. around running of these Zooms and I got, yeah. I got shut off. <laughs> um, thanks guys for continuing and I think what the key takeaway there is what um, Priya and Sean have been discussing is it's just really great to get a bit of a, a bank of evidence to yeah. really um, keep on hand to support, um, to support your claim as well. Um, Actually, Kathy, may I answer one more question? So there was just someone mm -hmm. who has asked the question regarding payment for the workers that experience reduction on working hours. Um, I won't go into the Thank details, you, Freya. But just something to be aware of. So obviously this business grant that I've been talking about is through SA Treasury website. For those who are, uh, who've got staff members who are trying to apply, you need to go to, um, your staff need to go to Services Australia. There is a South Australian COVID payment on Services Australia and they will apply, they need to apply for that lump sum one off payment on that website through their MyGov account. It's not something you can do for them. They have to do it themselves. Yeah, fabulous. Thanks for touching on that, Priya. Oh, I really okay. appreciate that. Um, Thanks, Priya. Everyone, Priya's going to stay on the call um, to participate in a bit of a Q&A if we've got any other questions that come to mind as we move through the session. Moving on, the current situation does raise considerations for employers on how it impacts their employees. I'm really pleased to have Sarah Lithgow, Special Counsel and Specialist in Workplace Relations, Employment and Safety Law, from Warman's Lawyers with us today. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us. Thanks, Cathy, and thank you for the introduction. You're welcome. Sarah, working from home is a great option, but it's not um, for everybody due to various different circumstances. What are some of the considerations employers perhaps need to look at during this time, particularly considering um, casual employment? You know, our sector really employs a lot of casual employees. Sure. Um, preparing for this um, conversation today, I was thinking about um, the, la the last year when obviously we were hugely inundated with questions about um, COVID lockdowns and um, stand downs. Dealing um, with employees is probably one of, well, from our perspective, it's what we hear about. It's one of the most difficult situations, particularly because everyone has empathy for the employees as well. You don't want to be standing them down without pay. Um, for those employers where you are directly affected by the lockdown, so you can't keep operating anymore, um, there is the potential to stand down employees without pay. Um, there are some 
relatively strict requirements around standing people down without pay um, in terms of protecting the employees. So you need to be able to demonstrate that there's actually no work that they could do um, and also that your business has been affected by something completely out of your control which in this case where there's been a statewide lockdown um, or even restrictions that limit the amount of work you're able to offer people um, stand downs might be appropriate in those circumstances um, mm. when you do stand an employee down um, unfortunately you can't kind of half stand down an employee it's an all or nothing approach there's always the option if you can, if you're suffering from redu a reduction in work rather than a complete lockdown where you can't do any, provide any services at all. Um, if, if there's a reduction, then there is the potential to reach agreement with your employees. So if an employee agrees to work reduced hours or um, to take a period of annual leave, then you can certainly reach individual agreements with those employees. Um, unfortunately, yeah. this year with the lockdown, we're a bit more limited in what you can do because last year with JobKeeper and JobKeeper directions, there was a bit more flexibility for employers to either reduce people's hours or change where their work location was or change the duties they performed without necessarily getting the employee's agreement. Right. So, yeah, talking on those changes of duties, um, sort of voluntarily temporary changes due to lockdown, um, this can be delivered verbally, but probably best to communicate it in writing too. Um, and perhaps forward thinking, is this something that should be considered more formally when we're doing reviewing employment contracts now, Sarah? Yes, certainly. So we, when we're preparing employment contracts, we always try and put a flexibility term in the contract, which essentially means you can direct the employee to perform functions or duties that aren't strictly what they're employed to do, as long as they've got the skills to perform those duties. So an employer can generally direct an employee to perform other duties where that direction is reasonable. So that would take into account whether the employee's got the qualifications for it, um, whether they're performed within the same usual hours that employee would work. Um, all of those kind of factors for the individual employee to make sure that what we call uh, is the direction is lawful and reasonable and, and as such defensible. Sure, no worries. And then sort of touching, moving on to leave entitlements then. So for Whilst I know that doesn't apply to casual employees, permanent part-time, full-time employees who have those leave entitlements, um, <coughs> can employers direct the staff to take their leave? Like, what, what's, what's their options? What's an employer's options to help support their employees during this time? Sure. So an employee can always um, take annual leave or a period of unpaid leave rather than being stood down. An employer, unfortunately, in the absence of the JobKeeper directions that we had last year, it's more difficult to direct an employee to take a period of leave. So there is the potential to direct employees to take a period of leave. Um, firstly, you need to look at any particular award or enterprise agreement that applies to work out what the rules are in that award. Um, but the, there are some restrictions on directing somebody to take leave. And usually that involves that they've got an excess accrual of annual leave. Um, and also that you need to give them notice of the requirement to take annual leave. So practically where you're faced with a lockdown that's implemented that day, directing an employee to take annual leave in the, within the current legislative framework may not be of that much benefit <coughs> to an employer. Um, having said that, if you sit down and have the frank discussion with your employees about, well, I'm either going to have to stand you down or, um, without pay or you've got some annual leave do you want to take that instead in our experience most employees are quite willing to consent to take annual leave and as long as both employer and employee agree to that period of annual leave um, then you can certainly access annual leave entitlements during a period where you couldn't otherwise per perform your role um, just on that there has been um, a case that went um, to the full federal court dealing with um, leave entitlements during a period of stand down. And it is quite clear that if you've actually stood down employees, so formally implemented a stand down because you've got nothing for them to do, then they can't take sick leave or compassionate leave during that period of stand down. Um, so that essentially means that if you stand an employee down, they've got an accrual of sick leave, they can't turn around and provide a medical certificate and say, no, I want 
to be paid and use up my sick leave instead of being unpaid. So that's really a bit, some protection to the employers when you've obviously implemented a stand down to try and save costs, you're not going to be faced with um, people trying to use up accrued sick leave. Yeah, sure. So touching on stand down, then can you talk us through those stand down provisions for companies, particularly in the last sort of um, five, seven days? Um, or even like we know, a lot of our members haven't just been impacted just because of lockdown. Um, mm -hmm. The impact has happened earlier because of the border restrictions. Can you talk us further through stand down provisions and and perhaps some recommendations on how um, an employer would work through? Sure. Um, so where you are looking to stand down an employee, you need to be able to show that there's actually no work that that employee can usefully perform. So it might be, that might be quite clear. If somebody's um, operating a cruise, cruise or something and that you just can't operate the cruise boat because of the government restrictions, there's clearly no work for, say, the captain of that boat to perform. Um, in some circumstances, there might be other work an employee could perform and that might not be work within their usual um, job description. So if, if there's um, work that can be done during the period of lockdown to help the business that's not actually that employee's role, you can offer them that work instead. Um, unfortunately, it, as I mentioned before, it is a bit of an all or nothing approach with a stand down. So if it's simply a reduction in hours um, or a reduction in workload, which you might see with the density requirements that have been implemented or a move to um, perhaps take away rather than only your full business operations, that's not necessarily going to justify standing down employees. That might be a situation where you're, it's more appropriate to work with the employees to agree about reduced hours or, um, or similar. Mm. Um, if you do stand down an employee, um, the best approach is always to um, try and consult with the employees first. So have, a, have the discussion with them. Um, as part of that discussion, um, as I mentioned, it might be that they prefer to take a period of paid leave than be unpaid for a potentially indefinite period. Um, it, there's no strict requirements to um, direct them in writing, but it always, uh, from a lawyer's perspective, putting things in writing and confirming the direction is always best practice. Um, there is the potential for employees to dispute a stand down as well. So if you decide to stand down employees because in your opinion, there's no work for them to perform, the employees could potentially dispute that and take that to the Fair Work Commission where the Fair Work Commission would have to look into whether the stand down is appropriate in all the circumstances. Sure, thanks Sarah. Um, really appreciate you being on the line today, Sarah, and you've provided um, some very informative information and, and some clarity around some of those areas for myself and I'm, I'm sure all our audience. Um, now, We've got some questions that are going to come th that are coming through the chat function, and Sean's going to open up and um, um, fire them at both Sarah and Priya, who have kindly stayed on for us today. Well, not fire them at, but uh, that sounds like a, um, a hard taskmaster there. But um, yeah, really, um, continuing to um, use the knowledge we've got on the line here with Sarah and Priya to answer any further questions. So um, to our audience, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat function. Um, Sean, did you want to, I'll hand that over to you now. Thanks very much, Cathy. Yes, um, so we've done some of the questions. Um, so I'll go through a few more. Um, <clears throat> Um, Mike's got a question about el eligibility for round one and round two. Mm -hmm. We are able to be based on accrual accounting regardless if BAS was cash. Is this still likely to be the case? Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question, Mike. Unfortunately, they haven't considered that um, at the moment, whether it is based on a cash or accruals basis, but it's going back to having like supporting documentation and making sure it's lined up with your formal documentation that you end up lodging like your basses and things like that. So at the moment they haven't confirmed that, but I would suggest that if you're doing it, if you've got a cash basis, you do it on a cash basis. If you've got an um, accrual basis, you do it on accrual because it's going to tie into your formal documentation. But again, I can't answer that with certain clarity because they haven't provided that guidance. We have, asked the question, but they haven't actually um, given us that detail yet. And um, Fraser's got a question about the um, 
Commonwealth grants for hotspot funding um, mm -hmm. is uh, available for regional SA. Has that been extended to regional? My understanding was that it had been extended to regional SA. Do you have an update? Yeah. yeah. So at the moment, there, there were some conversations last week, which was basically saying it, it's going, it's not talking about the business government grants that I was mentioning. This is talking about employee lump sum payments if you have a reduction in work. And there were some comments about, um, you know, there are certain parts of the region that are going to get stuck. At the moment, if you are, the Commonwealth grant isn't available to regional SA, the, there is whatever the couple of areas that the region is not covering, the state government's covering it. So everyone will be covered in South Australia with um, the support payments for employees. Um, Melwin Kimber has a question regarding um, hours. Um, so for workers that experience reduction in hours, is the application through the business or through Centrelink? Yeah, no, that, that's the one that you have, your employees will have to do through MyGov themselves. It's not about the business. If we're talking about those lump sum payments for employees, if they have a reduction in hours, the business doesn't have to do that. If the employees do it and they do it through Services Australia or um, through MyGov. And um, just one that, um, again, I've been put to by different businesses. Uh, obviously, we are a SME sector um, here. If, um, um, because we've had 18 months of, um, you know, um, too many shocks, <coughs> um, and the 75K um, minimum limit, for some businesses, because they've, um, been challenged over that 18 month period, particularly those that are in the international market space and interta interstate market space, they may not have reached that 75K because of all the shocks that we've been having over the last 18 months. Is there any, um, that, that income threshold, would, in those circumstances, would there be any consideration from government in terms of that threshold? They've been pretty strict saying if it's seven, and the general commentary is if you met 75,000 in the 2020 year or the 2021 year, you'll get these government grants. If you didn't meet it, then there's no support. That's my understanding currently, unfortunately. There is that threshold. That's one of the eligibility criteria. It's not just for 2021 year, because obviously 2021 year is in the, it's also for the 2020. So you can be more than 75,000 in the 2020 year, or the 2021 year, that's one of the strict eligibility requirements. Um, for the government you. grant, the business government grants. Yeah. Um, Carla has asked a question um, about, um, as a business, how can we support an employee to prove that they have lost work? Do they need a letter from them? Do you have any idea what the um, employee needs to provide in terms of proof of loss of income? Yeah, let me just, I'll just, I might just um, grab that from Services Australia because they have a bit of detail just while you're, if someone else has got a question, let me just, I'll find that answer. Okay, great. I think that's most of the questions on the chat. Um, and please put up uh, any other questions you might have on the chat. Yeah. Um, Sorry, just give me a second, I'll just answer that question. No worries, Priya. Any other thoughts that you might have had, Sarah, in terms of um, information for business? Um, just on uh, assisting employees to um, access any um, financial relief that might be available to them. Um, as Priya said, my it is through Services Australia. Um, I'm not precisely... I haven't looked at the um, application requirements for it, but I expect um, if, if, it's, if it's a matter of that you've actually separated with that employee, so if it's a casual employee saying you said we can, we've got no work for you, um, I, I know there is um, a separation certificate that an employee might provide to you, uh, which is through Services Australia, which you might be able to complete for them. Otherwise, I expect in terms of evidence for the employees, it may just be records of, for, for their usual pay slips, which show that um, you know they're not getting any pay yeah. that week. Um, it may, my, my understanding also is in terms of the disaster, I think they call referred to disaster payments for mm -hmm. employees. Um, they also need to show that there's no paid leave entitlements that they could access. So it might be that you have that discussion with the employee um, or that the employee asks to take a period of paid annual leave if they've got anything accrued before they can actually access those payments. Thanks, Sarah, that's great. And um, Priya, mm -hmm. anything else to add on that one? Yeah, it, look, it just says online that you're unable to earn your usual income of eight hours or more of full day's work. 
It doesn't say anything about an employer has to do a letter. I think timesheets would be sufficient because you need to show all of that. You also need to show that if you've lost income and you have annual leave, you need to take the leave first before you take before you entitled to this payment. Great, thank you. I'll back to you, Cathy. Yeah, thank you, ladies. Thanks, Sean. Thanks to Rodney. Thank you to Priya and Sarah. We've really appreciated having everybody online today and I trust this has been a very valuable session. Um, for all our members on the call today, if you do wish to connect with both Priya from Hood Sweeney or Sarah from Walmans, you are entitled to a, um, a complimentary consultation with Hood Sweeney and Walmans have a, a, a complimentary 15 minute advice line. So um, we'll include details on how you can access those services as an, a member of TICSA um, post this session in an email. Um, we've also recorded this session today. Um, so it can continue to be a resource for um, um, all of you as well. Um, so thank you all. Lastly, I just want to say a quick word in relation to the current situation and, and we can um, see how we're going to, we've been given the directive of how we're slowly moving out of this, but it does impact us all in, in personal ways. And it's really important to check on your employees and your loved ones just to see how they're going. Um, it doesn't need to be an awkward conversation. Actually, it's just a chat and let them know that you're there for them. It's not necessarily about having all the answers, but more than anything, just listening um, there. And it's also not forgetting to prioritise yourself during this time. Um, here, um, the TIC SA team, we have our own little staff group chat and um, we've been sharing our wellbeing activities that we've been trying to do remotely from daily hikes to some of us have been having a relaxing bath to having a t hit of tennis and even um, the novice in us trying yoga for the first time. So um, it's really important just to try and keep that sense of community with your colleagues, um, your employees and your loved ones um, and, and just continue to look out for everybody. So on that note, thank you all for your time today. I've, been really great to see all your faces and I hope you've appreciated uh, this session and found it valuable. We'll see you all again soon. Take care. <laughs>